Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hyperemesis gravidarum. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper and your pen and let's go. So remember that vomiting is actually a symptom that may be related to pregnancy. It may also sometimes be a manifestation of some medical or surgical or sometimes gynecological complication that may occur at any time period in the pregnancy. It can be classified based on when it's actually occurring. You can have early pregnancy vomiting, which may either be divided into vomiting that is related to pregnancy. We will talk about simple vomiting in pregnancy or the morning sickness, also referred to as emesis gravidarum. In this lecture, we will also focus much on hyperemesis gravidarum, which is known as pernicious vomiting, also in this lecture. It may be associated with pregnancy. It may be medical conditions such as intestinal infestations, urinary tract infections, hepatitis, DKA, uremia. Could be some surgical problems like appendicitis, peptic ulcer disease, intestinal obstruction, cholecystitis. It could be gynecological problems like a twisted ovarian tumor, red degeneration of a fibroid. Or indeed, it could happen in late pregnancy. It could be related to pregnancy, a continuation or reappearance of the simple vomiting of pregnancy. Or it could be an acute fulminant preeclampsia. It could be associated with a pregnancy, medical conditions such as intestinal infestations, urinary tract infections, hepatitis, DKA, uremia, or surgical complications of appendicitis, peptic ulcer disease, intestinal obstruction, cholecystitis, hiatalhenias, or indeed gynecological problems such as twisted ovarian tumors and red degeneration of a fibroid. So let's begin with the simple vomiting in pregnancy or morning sickness, also referred to as emesis gravidarum. So this would be in the background of a patient that complains of this nausea and occasional sickness that's going to be there most commonly in the morning. Remember that slight vomiting is a common symptom of early pregnancy in about 50% of the cases and it's actually considered as a symptom of pregnancy. It may occur also at other times of the day and often the vomitus is small in amounts, clear or it may be bowel stained. It doesn't produce any impairment of the health or restrict the mother's normal activities generally and it's meant to disappear with or without treatment, roughly at about 12 to 14 weeks. Remember that this is going to be caused by certain things like high levels of serum human chorionic gonadotrophin, estrogen as well as altered immunological states. These have been implicated as initiating factors and it can also be aggravated by neurological factors or neurogenic factors, especially when the mother is not really mentally prepared for this pregnancy or an unplanned pregnancy. Management includes reassurance, some lifestyle changes. You should advise the mothers to be taking dry toasts or biscuits, eating bland foods which are soft and not spicy, eating slowly, avoiding fatty and spicy foods, small frequent meals with plenty of fluids, about 2.5 liters in 24 hours. Take some fruit juice, ginger and some ginger extracts have been seen to help. The first line pharmacological therapy is going to be giving them vitamin B6, pyridoxin, 20, 22 50 milligrams one to three times a day, and doxalamine, 12.5 to 25 milligrams orally four times a day. It's an antihistamine. For the second line, if the simple measures actually fail, we can use antiemetics like promethazine, 25 milligrams orally daily, metoclopramide, five to 10 milligrams orally. We may also use diphenhydramine or ondecetron. Now, when it comes to hyperemesis gravidarum, remember this is going to be a severe type of vomiting. It's going to be a threat to the mother. So it's going to be having these negative effects on the health of the mother, and it can actually incapacitate this woman from carrying out her day-to-day -day activities. It's going to be this nausea and vomiting that is severe enough to cause weight loss greater than 5% of the pregnancy weight, dehydration, ketosis, and abnormal labs. It's most commonly limited to the first trimester. Adverse effects of the severe vomiting are going to include things like dehydration, metabolic acidosis, which is going to be as a result of this woman starving. You could also have alkalosis because you're losing this hydrochloric acid and electrolyte imbalances mostly with potassium, so they tend to present with hypokalemia. 
Risk factors include prime gravidus, a family history, especially with a first-degree relative, a mother or a sister, who also suffered from the same manifestation, identity from moles and multiple pregnancies. Remember, these associated with high levels of uh, human chorionic gonadotrophin hormone, as well as unplanned pregnancies. In the pathophysiology of the condition, the etiology is generally unclear, but there have been some suggested theories. One such theory is that there is certain hormones that are increased in in pregnancy. Excess in chorionic gonadotrophin hormones generally is associated with the condition, which is why we tend to see this most commonly in conditions which have high levels of HCG, such as high DT4 moles, multiple pregnancies. It also has been associated with high levels of estrogen, because remember that progesterone tends to relax the smooth muscles. So it tends to relax the cardiac sphincter, and it also stimulates retention of gastric fluid that can also be as a result of impaired gastric motility. Other hormones that have been implicated include thyroxine, prolactin, leptin, and adrenocortical hormones. Another suggested theory is something to do with the psychogenic phenomenon. Remember, this is probably aggravating the nausea once it begins, and this neurogenic element actually sometimes plays a role as evidenced by this uh, subsiding after shifting the patient from their home surrounding, you see that the symptoms actually subside. It may also be associated with some other conversion disorders, somatization and excessive perception of sensation by the mother, along with other theories that have been implicated. There may be sometimes a dietary deficiency, so low carbohydrates actually, uh, low carbohydrate reserves actually, as it happens after a night without food, or a deficiency in vitamins B6, B1, and some proteins have uh, maybe actually as a result of the effects of the condition rather than the cause. There have been also some allergic or immunological basis, and generally it may be as a result of decreased gastric motility that is uh, found to cause nausea. But remember, whatever the case may be, this person is having this severe vomiting and it's going to be aggravated by this neurogenic element. So unless it's not quickly rectified, it's going to lead to problems. It's going to lead to dehydration. And remember, this person may have this carbohydrate starvation that may supervene, and this will create this vicious cycle where this person is vomiting and they're not eating. And they're not eating, this leads to ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis triggers vomiting and you create this vicious cycle. So some systemic manifestations include manifestations of the brain. You may have these small hemorrhages in the hypothalamic region, giving the manifestation of Wernicke's encephalopathy. And these lesions are going to be related to vitamin B1 deficiency. The heart may be small, and this is a constant finding, and there may be this subendocardial hemorrhage. And in the circulatory system, there is this hemoconcentration, this false rise in the hemoglobin percentage, the RBC, as well as the hematocrit values. And there's a slight increase in the white cell count. Overally, there's also an increase in the eosinophil count with a concomitant reduction of the extracellular fluid. In the liver, you may have this centriloba fatty infiltration without necrosis. And remember that the, in the metabolic system, this person is going to be having low levels of carbohydrate reserves because they, are, they may be starving and they are continuously vomiting. So you use up your carbohydrates you use up your glycogen, it gets broken down into glucose, it, it gets used up, so the body is going to resort to these alternative sources of energy, so it's going to resolve in uh, the breakdown of fats. So there may be incomplete oxidation of fats and accumulation of these ketone bodies in the bloodstream, and remember that the acetone ultimately is going to be excreted in the kidneys and it's going to be excreted in the breath. So you may actually detect it on the urinalysis, you may actually have this fruity breath on the smell, the fruity breath smell. Then there is also an increase in endogenous tissue protein metabolism. You're also breaking down these proteins for gluconeogenesis so that you can make glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. There is some water and electrolyte metabolism that's going to be affected and this is going to lead to this biochemical as well as circulatory changes. Remember that you lose water and salts in the vomitus and this is going to result in a fall in the plasma levels of sodium, potassium and chlorides and generally the urinary chloride may be well below the normal 5 grams per liter or may even be absent. Remember that hepatic dysfunction is going to result in acidosis and the ketosis with a rise in the blood urea and uric acid levels. You may also have hypoglycemia, hypoproteinemia, hypovitaminosis, and rarely hyperbilirubinemia. Clinical features include the patients being naliparous in the early pregnancy, the onset being insidious, and generally 
these patients have symptoms of vomiting that is going to be increased in frequency with retching and a decreased urine output. And this may actually even be to the stage of oliguria. And remember that there is going to be some epigastric pain, some constipation that may occur, and complications tend to also appear at this stage. So on the signs, you may want to check your vitals, the weight, the heart rate, and you may also have some orthostatic blood pressure. There may be some features of dehydration and ketosis, so a dry-coated tongue, sunken eyes, acetone on the breath, tachycardia, hypotension, a rise in the temperature. You may have also some jaundice as a late feature. When you do your vaginal examination and your sonography, this is going to just reveal that this patient is actually pregnant. For the management purposes, we actually do divide the clinical course into early, where the vomiting occurs throughout the day and the normal day-to-day -day activities are curtailed, are going to be stopped. Then there is no evidence of dehydration or starvation. And late, where there is evidence of dehydration and starvation that are present. Investigations that you generally want to do a urinalysis, which is going to yield small quantities of urine that's are going to be concentrated. The urine will be dark in color. There will be high specific gravity with acid reaction. There may be presence of ketones and occasionally presence of proteins and rarely bowel pigments. There is diminished or absence of chlorides. With the serum electrolytes, potassium, sodium, and chloride tend to be reduced. So generally you have a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Generally, you also want to get your urea and creatinine, your blood glucose, and an ultrasound to rule out gestational trophoblastic disease as well as multiple gestation. An ophthalmoscopic examination may be required, especially if the patient is seriously ill because they may have retinal hemorrhage, detachment of the retina, in the most which are going to be the most unfavorable signs. An ECG must be done because you do have abnormal levels of potassium, low levels of potassium. And remember, a diagnosis of pregnancy should be confirmed first for you to make a diagnosis of hyperemesis gravidarum. All associated causes of vomiting should be excluded. An ultrasound is only useful when you want to confirm the pregnancy and to exclude other obstetric causes of hyperemesis, such as high dirty for moles, multiple pregnancies, gynecological, surgical, as well as medical causes of vomiting. In the management, you generally want to control the vomiting, control the fluid and electrolyte balance. You want to control the metabolic disturbances, whether acidosis or alkalosis, and you want to prevent any serious complications of vomiting. You generally want to admit your patients, you assure them and offer them some social and psychological support. Fluids are of importance, so oral fluids are going to be withheld for at least 24 hours after cessation of vomiting. Then during this period, you want to give this woman IV fluids. So generally, they must receive about 3 liters in 24 hours. 1.5 liters consisting of 5% dextrose and 1.5 liters consisting of Ringer's lactate. Generally, the extra amount of 5% dextrose is going to be equal to the amount of vomitus and urine in 24 hours that is to be added. Generally, you also want some enteral nutrition through a nasogastric tube, though this may be rarely needed because the women are able to feed. You do also want to consider some antiemetics, promethazine or phenigan, 25 milligrams, prochlopremazine, uh, uh, at 5 milligrams. You may also consider other things like metoclopramide, which can actually stimulate gastric and intestinal motility without actually stimulating secretions, and it can be used. Hydrocots and 100 milligrams IV in a drip can be given in cases of hypotension or intractable vomiting, and oral prednisolone in, can be used in severe cases. You also want some nutritional supplementation with vitamin B1, B6, vitamin C, and B12. Generally, you want to record the vitals, the pulse, the temperature, the blood pressure at least twice. The input-output charts, do a urinalysis for the acetone, the proteins, and the bowel salts. Then, as well as the blood biochemistry and an ECG if your potassium is abnormal. Signs of improvement are going to include subsidence of the vomiting, a feeling of hunger, the patient is generally going to look better, disappearance of the ketones from the breath as well as from the urine, and normal vitals, so normal pulse, normal blood pressure, and normal urine output. And generally, before the IV fluid is omitted, the foods are going to be given orally. At first, you give dry carbohydrates like biscuits, bread, toast, and then small but frequent meals are going to be recommended, and then gradually, you reintroduce the full diet. Termination of pregnancy is rarely indicated, and it's Intractable hyperemesis gravidarum in spite of therapy is actually quite rare these days. Complications include dehydration, starvation, and ketoacidosis. Neurological complications may be Wernicke's encephalopathy due to thiamine deficiency, pontine myelinosis, you may have peripheral neuritis, Korsakoff, 
uh, psychosis, stress ulcers in the stomach, esophageal tears, like a Mallory Weiss tear, because of this excessive retching and vomiting, jaundice, you may also have convulsions, coma, and renal failure. I really hope you enjoyed this lecture on hyperemesis gravidarum. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. We're almost at 8,000 subscribers. I'm sure by the time most of you watch this video, would have already crossed the 8,000 subscriber threshold. If you haven't, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon such that you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to show some support. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.